I'm Jack Rickard, Electric Vehicle Television. Today, I'm going to continue a bad trail to the side for me over the uh, SARS-CoV-2 Kung Flu uh, and the stock market um, that hasn't got a whole lot to do with what I like to do. Uh, I'm calling this date, um, which is, uh, let's see here, March 28th, Saturday, um, as the peak of the hysteria uh, regarding this uh, virus. Been in a very odd position in that I'm a complete naysayer regarding the, uh, a denialist uh, in the hysterics surrounding this virus and the unbelievable blast of misinformation and disinformation about it that has come about. Um, while at the same time, I'm a little bit of a germaphobe and uh, I've been following influences and influenza-like diseases for many years, starting with a book that I read called The Great Influenza years and years ago, maybe decades ago, about the 1917-1918 uh, influenza. So I know a little bit more about it than I quite should, and um, really than I quite want to. And that's probably about enough to be a little bit dangerous. But man, the stuff I'm seeing in the media is so bad that um, I just, I don't even know what to think about it. I'm, I'm blasted into my chair every day uh, by just a all channels 24 seven blast of nonsense over what is actually a pretty serious virus. And I do take it quite seriously. Um, the virus is termed severe acute re respiratory syndrome, coronavirus number two. There's a reason for that. We had uh, one previous, and it uh, also came out of China in 2003. Uh, and the biggest difference is it had a mortality rate somewhere in the 14% range. Uh, if you take today's figures from the John Hopkins um, screen, we have 105,470 confirmed cases of coronavirus or Kung Flu, SARS-CoV-2 uh, today with uh, 1,711 sadly deceased individuals coming to it. And that's a calculated mortality rate of 1.62%. As I've mentioned earlier, confirmed cases is very squishy. And um, of course, um, many of those people have not been through the full cycle of the disease. So we don't know if they're dead yet or they're uh, um, going to survive, but our best calculation, and the way the CDC does do it, is to divide fatalities by confirmed cases. And um, that would indicate 1.62%. It's been about 1.5%. I think eventually we'll find this virus falls uh, to about point five to point seven percent mortality, which is five or six times as deadly as um, the ordinary influenza. Type A is H1N1, type B is a little less, more, less common version. And uh, so, it is serious and it is um, infectious, uh, really no more and perhaps less infectious 
than uh, ordinary H1N1 influenza. But um, certainly five or six times, could be 15 times at the fatality rate. And so that's why it's uh, kind of a serious virus. Um, let's uh, take a look at some flu data just to have fun. And uh, let's see here, what have I got? According to the CDC, from October 1, 2019 to March 21st, 2020, there have been 34 million to 54 million flu illnesses. Now they don't do tests to confirm that, they're extrapolations from uh, 18 million to 26 million medical visits to the doctor for influenza, resulting in 400,000 to 730,000 hospitalizations and 24,000 to 62,000 flu deaths. And they can't buy airtime. No news channel will talk about this, but that's the type A and B. Uh, influenza, largely uh, type B or type A. Let's take a look here. Yeah. Out of those tested, um, influenza A is about 76.7% .7 of those. Influenza B is about 2 23.3% of those. And so they can't get oxygen. No one will even talk about them, much less vote them any money for something that has already killed this year uh, somewhere between 24,000 and 62,000 people. So uh, many people are saying, don't compare the coronavirus to the flu. Well, why not? Why wouldn't you compare it to flu? It's almost identical symptoms. Uh, it's almost identically the same disease. It is caused by a different virus and has a uh, significantly higher mortality rate. Um, but it's not um, really dealing with anything different. And I'm not saying that we should ignore the coronavirus. I'm saying, why haven't you been paying attention to influenza? Why haven't we been doing social distancing on that? Where is the $2 trillion for influenza? Um, this is just kind of a disconnect that I don't quite get. Uh, one of the things that I want to talk about is the vilification of China and the Chinese. Uh, over the, I've even been accused of it because I call it the Kung Flu. Uh, interestingly, I first mentioned that about a month ago. I believe I coined the term and it's made it all the way around the country to the point where the media was accusing some White House staffer of referring to it as the Kung Flu and that that's somehow a bad thing. This is a reference to a David Carradine television show about from back in my day in the 70s called Kung Fu. And uh, it would be properly termed in the vernacular as the Wuhan flu um, or the Wuhan virus. And as President Trump has correctly noted, it is a Chinese virus, as SARS-1 was. Um, they're both apparently deriving from a bat uh, genome, and um, the uh, both came from out of China, which is not unusual uh, for influenza strains. Um, and so 
Uh, I don't get it. What's the problem? It's the, the Kung flu. It uh, comes from China. It's a Chinese thing. But I've seen some astonishing things, and I'm going to fuss about this a little bit, um, about vilifying China for a microbe, <laughs> including our own Senator Josh Hawley, who I contributed over $10,000 to his election campaign uh, here in Missouri, and Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas, both Republican senators, and who are ab absolutely vitriolic um, diatribes against China as our enemy. And people need to know they are our enemy um, and they are the cause of this virus and have deliberately pretty much conspired to implant it on Americans. I've never heard such nonsense. This is sub 90 IQ. Uh, I don't even know what it is. It's so stupid. Um, but certainly uh, this is broken out on Fox News who normally rail against fake news and are now fully committed to it. They have gone over to the dark side. Tucker Carlson is absolutely venomous in his attacks on China over this virus. Sean Hannity echoes every word. And Laura Ingram is just apoplectic about these nasty um, tr Chinese attacking the U.S. with this virus. And all media are claiming that Chinese hid the information on that. I'm going to talk a little bit about the timeline and how <clears throat> totally absurd all of that disinformation, not misinformation, but disinformation, they have to know better because an eight-year-old girl would know better. <clears throat> Patient number one is actually pretty well known. He started feeling bad on December 10th and was admitted to the Wuhan Central Hospital uh, on December 16th. His name is Wei Gui, uh, Gui Um and he had an, a respiratory infection in both lungs, pneumonia basically. But oddly, it would not respond uh, to any of the uh, normally um, fairly effective anti-influenza drugs. <clears throat> now, I mark that as um, Pearl Harbor. That's the day of the virus attack. The first guy is admitted to the hospital with a uh, uh, coronavirus infection, apparently. Now, there's all kinds of stories about it that have been going on since way earlier. None that can be validated or verified anywhere. They're fantasies. We know who the first guy was, and we know where he showed up. And the notable thing about it was a um, respiratory infection in both lungs that would not respond to anti-influenzal drugs. Uh, and everybody in China knows this. Um, now, if you <coughs> pick up the virus from that date to showing symptoms, to developing the disease, to recovering from the disease, and reaching the point where you test negative for the virus is somewhere in the 14 to 21 day range. So for one patient to go through the cycle and survive it, is uh, 14 to 21 days. I want you to keep that in mind because 14 days from December 16th would put you at December 30th. 
On December 30th, I Fen, a cop director at the Wuhan Central Hospital, posted on WeChat about the new virus. She was reprimanded for doing so and told not to spread information about this. Wuhan doctor Li Wen Liang also shared information on WeChat about the new SARS-like virus, and he was called in for questioning shortly afterwards. People have portrayed that as he was arrested and no one knows what's happened to him since. He was not arrested. He was brought in from, from, for questioning and sadly has died from the virus since then. The Wuhan Health Commission, on the same day, December 30th, notified all the area hospitals of a pneumonia of unclear cause and ordered them to report any related information as soon as possible. Now that's 14 days after the first patient shows up. Who's going to do anything quicker? Okay, well, the, the Chinese uh, local authorities there <coughs> and the Chinese government are trying to keep this a secret. You know, that kind of doesn't hold water. <laughs> Uh, on December 31st, China notified the World Health Organization of the new coronavirus. And Wuhan health officials confirmed 27 cases of the illness. So by December 31st, there's 27 SARS-CoV-2 infections in the world. So how can they be hiding it if they notified the World Health, Health Organization of it? On January 7th, a week later, Xi Jinping, the president of China, uh, makes the first public announcement of the virus. Now, this is only going to work for those of you who've ever, like, had a job, worked in a corporation, or worked for the government. But we're looking at two weeks and a day from the point of having a first patient to reporting it to the World Health Organization on a new virus. How does that even happen? How do you get from a local hospital room to get the attention of the president of a country of 1.4 billion people and get a public announcement to the uh, World Health Organization that you have a, a, a new virus going? If I was the president of China or of anything, and they told me they had some patients with a new virus, apparently, and... Uh, that it was a respiratory illness and they were having difficulty in treating it, what would my or your response be? Get me more information, confirm this. Let's don't go out and go public and alarm everybody in the world until we have something concrete to offer. Let's not press the global pandemic panic button based on the information we've gleaned from not even having a full cycle of the disease in a single humanoid. Yet, on January 7th, as the Jinping announced it in public, on January 9th, China announces it has mapped the coronavirus genome and released the gene sequence to the world in a published paper, made the data available globally. <clears throat> what kind of transparency were you hoping for? On January 15th, the patient who becomes the first confirmed U.S. case 
leaves Wuhan and flies to the USA carrying the coronavirus. On January 21st, six days later, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention confirms that first case of the coronavirus in the United States. In that six days, the, the patient wasn't a patient, he was a person, left China, arrived in the U.S. and developed symptoms and it was reported, and, and by the January 21st, the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention confirms through testing the first coronavirus case in the United States. How can this even be done in six days? In China, the CCP flagship newspaper, People's Daily, mentions the coronavirus as an epidemic and details Z's actions to fight it for the first time. The same day, January 21st, China's top political commission in charge of law and order warns that anyone who deliberately delays and hides the reporting of virus cases out of his or her own self-interest will be nailed on the pillar of shame for eternity. Now here in the US, we might find you, we might incarcerate you. We actually have the power to execute you. But no one in all of our judicial system would ever dare nail someone to the pillar of shame for eternity. We just don't do that. On January 23rd, Wuhan and three other cities are quarantined, locked down. On January 29th, six days later, the White House forms a coronavirus response task force and Trump issues an order blocking all travel from China to the U.S. And on the next day, January 30th, the World Health Organization declares a global health emergency. Now the head of the World Health Organization has lauded both China and the U.S. for their transparency and timely response. Um, does any of this match up with what you've been told about the vile, vindictive Chinese attack on the U.S. with this virus? Or Trump's late response? We're talking December 16th to January 30th. I've never heard anything moving that fast in any government, and we got it going on with two of them. I would rate that as stellar performance. Actually, I don't even know how they did it. I guarantee you, you couldn't make any of that happen in either country. And these little girls on TV Spouting nonsense certainly couldn't. It's, um, this has been a, a stellar serial case of absolute heroes performing at optimum levels. I'm in awe. Awe and amazement. We had the right two guys running the right two countries at exactly the right time. And that is uh, pretty much the story on the Chinese uh, attack, uh, conspiracy, hiding information, and so forth. You can't walk around with papers in your hand this fast and this responsive. 
and published the genome sequence. Dozens of papers published in China from January 7th till the end of January that you can Google right now. It's, this isn't a guess. These are days, serial days, and there isn't enough of them to cram a conspiracy into them by anybody. You can't get a late Trump response wedged in there sideways. You can't get a conspiracy and delay by Xi Jinping wedged in between the dates. If you can count to 21, you can readily see this. If you can count to 14 and would rather use a base 14 arithmetic on this whole episode, it comes out the same way, guys. These are not villains. These are heroes. Absolute heroes. I'm aghast. I'm not a believer in governments. I don't think they can work this well. Ever. But the evidence is in front of me. And it's in front of you. And you can't get it to come out otherwise. Uh, are there other responses, comments, criticisms leveled along the way in this timeline? You can't build a bridge out of a deck of cards without a bunch of pencil necks standing around telling you how you shouldn't do it. It's not going to work that way can't be done, shouldn't be done, and uh, criticizing it. But I'm astonished. December 16th to January 30th on this timeline is just... The only thing more uh, absurd I've heard was last night Joe Biden claimed to have published a paper in the middle of January on the topic. An outright bare-faced lie, which um, Anderson Cooper... I responded with, oh, wow, great, I didn't know that. It's a bare-faced lie. But the channel's full of them. Let's talk about Andrew Cuomo and test kits and testing in general. One of the reasons Korea has done so well is uh, they've been through the first SARS and took hits and MERS. We really didn't either case, but South Korea did. And <clears throat> they have uh, put a lot of money and time and research into viral test kits. And better yet, they have several companies who, in a, a raw greed for... Um, dollars have become very competitive in uh, producing better versions of them and more of them ever since going back to 2003 so they've done a lot of testing you get tested very easily in south korea if you just want to test and you don't have any symptoms that aren't sick uh you can go get a test and you pay 40 bucks if you um, test positive, I think give you the 40 bucks back. Um, what a neat system, huh? In any event, Andrew Cuomo is actually the brother of Chris Cuomo on CNN. And the only way they would approach Trump's level of intelligence is if they were co-joined at the skull from birth so tightly that even um, our head of uh, uh, housing and urban development, where does the memory go, uh, couldn't even separate them. Uh, in any event, Andrew Cuomo is the heir apparent to the Democrat presidential nomination, not Joe Biden. The plan is to keep um, um, Bernie in to deny Joe the um, majority 
so they can get past the first vote and then Joe Biden is not going to be selected as the uh, presidential nominee. Andrew Cuomo's uh, campaigning for it really hard. And so he came out fast and furious, stamping his little foot and screaming into the camera that Trump wasn't doing enough and that he was demanding, demanding test kits be delivered to him personally and that New York be allowed to use their own state laboratories and uh, hospitals to administer uh, and run the testing. Amazingly, Trump said, yeah, here's all the test kits you need. Be careful what you ask for. And Cuomo even came on TV and said, boy, this Trump's not such a bad guy. He's sending me all these test kits. Well, Andrew, be careful what you ask for. I'm sure that Trump did this after consulting with Dr. Fauci. You see, the number of uh, confirmed cases we have in the U.S. is dependent on a single thing you have to test positive in a test. In most of the country, if you're standing there, have coughed up a lung and it's hanging out on your shirt, you can't actually get a test unless you're an NBA basketball star. So the president sent uh, Governor Cuomo a bunch of test kits and told him he didn't care if he ran the tests in um, street uh, trucks that normally serve pizza or tacos. Just do with them whatever you want. And so he did. He started testing. And it wasn't 10 days until he faced another problem. Would you believe that half half of the confirmed cases of coronavirus in the United States are located in the state of New York. And people are fleeing New York because that's where all the coronavirus is, as everybody knows. <laughs> well, not exactly. <laughs> so the media didn't pick up on it, but this last Monday, uh, Cuomo announced that they would test people uh, who were reporting to the hospital with symptoms, but they're not going to just be randomly testing anybody that shows up at the drive through window anymore. And why would Trump do this? And Fauci, why would he want to do this? Hmm. They must be mean, vicious people trying to uh, undercut uh, these um, out left libtard Democrats, huh? Well, not exactly. If you took a state and you made it test kit rich and you did a lot of testing, you could kind of use that data from them to extrapolate the true level of the coronavirus infection um, against the number of people, the number of people in New York who had been tested and the number of people that are died. See, it's hard to hide a dead body. So we got really good numbers on... Um, the fatality rate in New York. The number of people dead from coronavirus who tested positive from coronavirus and are now dead. So we know exactly how many people were uh, died in New York and that they had tested positive from coronavirus. <laughs> and we know exactly how many people were tested in New York and what percentage of that came from um, the uh, 
coronavirus. And we know uh, pretty good how many people are in New York. And so New York was used as a guinea pig by the administration to develop a more finely tuned and more accurate meter. Now, I'm not sure they're going to share this information with us immediately, but they can now gauge more specifically how many people should be testing positive in any state and how many people should die uh, from those testing positive. It doesn't really work because of the patchy way that mm, coronavirus spreads, but assuming it spreads about as well. Remember, all the people from China came in on the West Coast, so New York would be the best place to do that, although they have a lot of international travel from Europe. But if you're wondering where to do it, and here comes Andrew Cuomo demanding to be the guinea pig, part, party like a rock star. Here's some test kits. You go, girlfriend. And so that's what I think happened uh, with the test kits. And, uh, and so there you are. Um, I think you'll find Andrew Cuomo's much less enthusiastic about testing these days and demanding test kits. He's moved on to trying to demand um, ventilators and face masks and so forth. Uh, on the topic of face masks, gag me. He came on TV and expressed outrage, absolute venomous outrage, that they were able to get masks at 85 cents a piece. And now he was being forced to bid against other states with manufacturers for face masks and was paying $7. And this was price gouging. You know, it's kind of not, Andrew. It's supply and demand. And if you don't want to pay that, let the face masks go to Arkansas or California if they're willing to pay it. It's not really the manufacturers setting the price. It's the demand for the masks. And if you haven't heard, there's a war on. You don't get them for 85 cents because they're not there. <clears throat> what struck me so uh, was then Trump comes out in support of this and he's got the Attorney General of the United States bar threatening to uh, incarcerate anyone who's found hoarding or price gouging face masks at like $7 for an 85 cent mask. Now here's why I'm a little ticked off on this. You know, I've been to the hospital. I don't go very, very much. Uh, oh, every six or seven years, usually. I, I've enjoyed, actually I know all of you are worried about me, but the reason I kind of shine it on is all my life. I I can't really have a primary care doctor because I don't know any doctors. If I name one, by the time I get sick, he's not even practicing anymore. Often he's dead. <laughs> and so um, you want to be sure to get your health care from a U.S. medical doctor whose median age at death is 58.6 years. They don't live very long, and uh, I don't want to be like them. But the, um, in any event, uh, I actually have suffered embarrassingly good health all my life. I just don't break bones. I get, don't get diseases. I just sort of skate by. Smoking my camels, drinking Dr. Pepper, not exercising. I can't say my health hadn't suffered, but... I don't really go to the doctor very often. Uh, in any event, I have been to the hospital. <coughs> and I find it amazing that they would have the temerity 
to charge me $8 each for every Tylenol tablet they shoved down my throat. It's on the bill. Why would they charge me $8 for a Tylenol tablet when you can get a 500 count bottle of them for that? And are we actually going to talk about price gouging and supplying things to hospitals? Next time you go to the hospital, tell them that you don't want to pay eight bucks a tab for the Tylenol and your wife's gonna pick up a bottle and bring it her next visit and see what the response is. You can't take Tylenol from outside the hospital. You have to take their Tylenol at $8 a tab. The United States medical system defines and is the poster child for price gouging worldwide, they set the upper limit of what can be charged and, and, and beyond which you would consider ridiculous. Six or eight dollars for an aspirin or Tylenol tablet. Fourteen dollars for a swab. It's, uh, that, that we would be having a conversation about price gouging, hospitals for supplies is astonishing and demonstrates the incredibly discouraging intellectual level of the governor of New York. And A.G. Barr was embarrassed to be on the stage with this and Trump should have never fallen into this obvious trap. Let's talk about face masks a little bit. There have been a couple of studies published that do appear to correct my uh, misconception that most viruses die within 45 minutes or an hour of being outside the body. Actually, uh, that's true. But they've done some half-life testing. One of the critical things is um, transmission by aerosol. And aerosol could be defined when you sneeze or you cough, you project droplets into the air containing uh, the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus and they uh, they can go eight or ten feet and then they tend to drop down onto the floor or the table or the keyboard or the computer screen or whatever where they can survive for some period of time the uh, but by far uh, the the most transmissive part is actually not those droplets. It's droplets less than five um, micrometers in size. And at about that size, the droplet is so light that it tends to be victim of every waft of air. And it kind of remains suspended in the air. And the viruses are contained within that. See, there's a huge scale of um, sizes in the universe. I'm one size, the Grand Canyon's another size, and I'm real small compared to the Grand Canyon. Well, a human cell is one size. Let's say it's the size of a hat box. And a virus is a certain size. And compared to a hat box, that's the size of an aspirin tablet. It's uh, very small compared to the size of a human cell. So in a five micrometer or less droplet of um, um, expectorant, um, there could be hundreds of thousands of viruses. 
but they're going to start to die off. <laughs> uh, there's been a March 20th publication in the New England Journal of Medicine um, about a study showing a half-life of both uh, COVID-1 and COVID-2 SARS viruses. And COVID-2 has a half-life of about 1.1 or 1.2 hours. And so that means that viability of the virus, if you had 100,000 viruses in a droplet, half of them would be non-viable within 1.1 or 1.2 hours. Um, within 2.2 hours, you'd have a quarter or 25,000. Um, within uh, um, another 1.1 hours, you'd have an eighth, 12,000. And uh, in another 1.1 hours. So it decreases by half with each 1.1 hours. I've got a little problem with this, and I said this when I made the original statement, that really they got 45 minutes to an hour, and I'm not wrong. The test was to use a uh, nebulizer and create an aerosol and put it into a closed drum. <clears throat> Blow it into a closed drum and then take samples from that. Uh, that's not really the same as blowing it into the room. Um, for one thing, you have a lot higher evaporation rate of the um, aerosols. A lot more dispersal of the aerosols because it's in a wide open area. And so not only do you have a uh, diminishing um, viability of the virus within the aerosol, but simply the, the density of the aerosols immediately starts to disperse and they start to evaporate, become subject to environmental influences. So I'm going to tell you, I still think it's 45 minutes or an hour um, where you have a realistic chance of spreading the virus by aerosols. Um, some more on surfaces, up to 72 hours on some plastics and steels where they could be viable uh, if they were under the same control conditions as the test, but longer. And this is why you want to wipe down surfaces with disinfecting wipes. And wash your hands a lot. You put your hands on the table, the keyboard, or the screen, or whatever, uh, doorknobs, and so forth. Your skin is a barrier to the viruses, by the way. They can't even begin to pierce the skin. The skin thickness would be like, um, again, compare something the size of a hat box to a BB. <coughs> But if you pick it up and it's on your hand and you pick your nose or mouth or rub your eyes like I do constantly, um, that would be a way to get the virus. And that's where the hand washing comes in. Certainly if like Joe Biden, you cough into your hand and then try to shake my hand, I'm gonna be somewhat resistant. Um, and so, uh, that's part of it. <clears throat> but I heard a U.S. Senator talking about visiting his mother, which he shouldn't do at all, and it being okay because he was walking five feet behind her. They were maintaining the recommended five feet. Well, I thought it was six feet, but then now it's five feet. The five or six feet doesn't do very much, guys. Um, I do believe in the 45 minutes or an hour version of that. And I acknowledge it could be two or three hours on an aerosol where if somebody walks into the room and doesn't ever cough at all, just exhales. 
and you walk into the same room in that time period and breathe in some of that air or those aerosols through your nose or mouth or get them in your eyes, you've caught the virus. You were never within six feet of them, just breathing the same air within an hour or two and you're infected. And so uh, be very careful even following uh, the recommendations of these people. And that brings us to the big topic of face masks. This is criminal. And somebody, starting with the president, but working his way down to have plenty of friends, should be in prison for life for this. I don't care about their intentions. It's a lie. What I find astonishing is the same media that'll pick up on any nonsense never does get this one. Because they quote medical professionals left and right who regularly say that you do not need a face mask to protect yourself from the virus. And in the same breath, in the same sentence almost, they tell you besides, we need to reserve them for our healthcare professionals to protect them from getting the virus. Did you pick up on that? It doesn't do any, offer any protection to the virus. One guy at an epidemiology center actually said, well, it doesn't do any good because the viruses are so small, they go straight through the mask anyway, so it won't do any good at all. And then he followed up by saying, and anyway, we need them for our healthcare professionals. They don't want you to buy and hoard masks because they need them for the nurses and the doctors. And they're willing to tell you directly into the camera and knowing better when they tell you this, that they're not going to offer you any protection from being infected by the virus. What are you to make of that? If you're a sentient humanoid with an IQ of above about 40, what is your response? Do I have to spell this out for you? Well, if I do, let me just not and point you to China where every video segment shows everybody in the country, including the president, wearing a face mask. And while you're lauding the Koreans for all the good work they're doing and how they've kept it under control, take a look at the shots from Korea. They're all wearing face masks. N95 face masks. So if a country like China, which has 80,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus in a population of 1.4 billion people, and we have 105,000 confirmed cases in a population of 320 million people, do the math and try to avoid the whole thing where, you know, Michael Bloomberg, if he had just saved the $500 million, could have given each of 327 million people a million dollars. Don't fall into the second grade arithmetic traps that Brian Williams and Marla Gay and, and a lot of these people on TV fall prey to. Uh, I would refer you to the 21 day thing on the timeline of the uh, coronavirus discovery for the same uh, basic thing. We're not, mathematics by the way, includes algebra, geometry, trigonometry, differential equations, uh, integral calculus, 
six times nine is part of second grade arithmetic. Division, multiplication, and, ad and addition. Of course, I'm a little out of touch because I was educated by nuns on horseback with shotguns. So I can't really relate to your public school system very well. But we considered that not mathematics, but arithmetic. And you were expected to pretty much master it by the fourth grade because they had bigger aspirations for what you would be studying. So, the uh, I think you've been fed a line on the face mask, and our culture does not entirely include the use of face masks, but that's because we don't have the population densities of South Korea or China or Hong Kong or Japan. Japan, everybody wears a face mask if they have any sign of disease as a courtesy to not spread it to other people. But if they're having any kind of widespread influenza, everybody starts wearing a face mask. I lived over there for about 40 years and it's just, it appears to be cultural, but it's just kind of the ignorance of Americans. And we kind of get away with it because of our population densities. Um, we're not really going to get away with it this time. You need a face mask. I'm going to put up here a uh, website, HTTP, www.niuwtp.com. This is uh, probably our oldest and most trusted supplier in Japan. It's called NIU Industries. Uh, I designed a battery strap, probably 2010. Uh, might have been 2009, maybe 2010. And they agreed to make them for me. Um, and have made our battery straps ever since then. A very old man. Hito Chin does this, and he reached out to me. China, as uh, it's not over there. They are now banning uh, any foreigners from coming into Japan or into China. <coughs> the N95 face mask made by 3M and the N95 mask made by Honeywell the reason the president's a little bit hesitant to in, invoke the War Powers Act on them is because they don't make masks. All their masks are made in China. And so, um, had to contact me. China, China now has a glut of face masks because that's where all the face mask making machines are. And um, and said, hey, uh, I hear y'all are having problems with the virus. Do you need any face masks? And I said, I don't know. What what can you do for me? Uh, what quantity could I get them? And he said, oh, we could do one to three million for you. I said, so you're just trying to get me into jail here, buddy. Um, the uh, they're crazy here. Uh, these people have, have gone. If I bought a million for it from you, I could take them and give them to the local hospital. They'd still probably put me in jail because they're they've just gone crazy. The hysteria is uh, works. I said, why don't you sell me two thousand of them, and I can use those for myself, family, the employees at EVTV, the. Uh, um, friends, that sort of thing. And so we'll have masks. Um, and so he did. And, uh, the price was like $2.66 for an N95. Now you can get just as good a mask for about a buck 85. It's a KN95. And all that is, is it's an N95 done to the 
Chinese specifications instead of the N95 to the FDA specs here in the United States. So wait a minute. The doctor told you that the mask can't filter out the viruses. But you know what? That's quite true. A virus could pass right through the mask if there were any viruses in the air. But they're not. They're in the droplets. And the N95 is um, sufficiently um, manufactured to block uh, even quite small aerosols um, from, if, if you made a mask where you couldn't um, pass the virus, you also couldn't breathe. The N95 is a little bit difficult to breathe through, but the, it's in layers, it's like a baby diaper. And the outer layer is meant to absorb, trap and absorb the droplets, the aerosol drops of, of liquid. And so the virus is entrapped there on the outer layer. And then there's several propylene later, layers and so forth that filter it from there to the inner layer. <coughs> <coughs> By the way, I saw a gal on YouTube spoofing this. And she had a pair of Huggies toddler diapers on her head with one of the leg holes uh, there for her eyes. And she could put, it, put a pair of goggles over that. Uh, I think she's on to something. I think that would very nearly be as effective as an N95 face mask. <coughs> and for the same reason and for the same construction. And um, then I saw Ed Pizant, and he sent me on Facebook um, a photo of him wearing his underwear with one leg hole for his eyes. And I thought, you know, that wouldn't be as good, but it'd be better than nothing. Um, two pair would be better, Ed. <clears throat> one to trap the droplets and then one for you to breathe through. But N95 masks are available. And they're available at a reasonable price. And you're not really hoarding. Hoarding would be like going to the grocery store or Amazon.com and buying up all the available stock. China can make millions of these things. And you can call and order a few thousand and you're not taking anything off the market or blocking anyone from getting them. Could Andrew Cuomo do the same thing? He could, except he's too freaking stupid to do it. This guy's running a state. He doesn't have time for silly things like information and knowledge. And, and, uh, and besides, those Chinese are bad people. He should avoid them. He wants U.S. made masks. Now, there is a company in Texas, by the way, that manufactures masks, but I don't think you'll be able to get any of them now. Uh, in fact, I don't think you'll be able to get them at the hardware store. I don't think you'll be able to get them at the grocery store. Or you can't get them at Amazon.com. Alibaba's your friend, but I've given you a uh, website that actually uh, they can produce, they can provide quite a quantity. And China is kind of in mass glut right now. And so that's the story on masks. Number one, you do need them if you want to be safe from this virus. And number two, um, uh, you can get them. Um, but it's amazing to me that people have bought into the concept that you don't need them 
but that the healthcare professionals do. Well, they need to be safe. You're apparently expendable. Stay with us. I want to talk a little bit about hydrochloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and erythromycin. And I want to talk about the difference between a drug and a treatment. President Trump never said that this was a cure for um, coronavirus. And it's not, by the way. Um, and Dr. Fauci never corrected him. What Trump said was that it might work and it might not. There was some interesting data from France that indicated that it could be effective against coronavirus. And he felt really good about it. And Dr. Fauci said that that data was anecdotal and it needed more testing. And the press, and I continue to be astonished at their level of, um, I used to think they were evil. They're not, they're just stupid. They, they can't follow an English conversation. It, it's astonishing. There was no conflict between them. They both said something, and it sounded to the press like two different things. And it never was. Um, but it goes to a basic misunderstanding about medicine that I didn't know you didn't know. I was unaware people thought this way. I, I didn't, I was unaware you were unaware. But a drug is not a cure for anything. There are no drugs that are cures for anything. It's an absurd notion, they're chemical. In most cases, not all cases, but in most cases. Uh, a treatment can be curative and we can uh, actually cure a number of ail ailments um, with a treatment that uses a drug as its primary constituent. But it's not, the drug itself by itself is not a cure. It's not only not a cure, it's normally dangerous unless done as part of a planned procedure or treatment. Uh, oh, as an aside, this idiot, the media, uh, without actually, in this case it was evil because they knew to leave out part of the story, was that Trump was mentioning hydroxychloroquine um, and inadvertently caused the death of a man in Arizona who took, took um, I don't even know what it was, chloroquine phosphate, I think, an aquarium cleaner and died. And then they reported it as if he'd taken the hydroxychloroquine but in any event, you don't really want to take hydroxychloroquine and try to treat yourself. <clears throat> I often resent the fact that you can go to Mexico and just go into a pharmacia and buy any drug you want. Here, you have to have a prescription. And I think that is done to protect protect the cash stream of the hospitals and the doctors. I really do. Um, what was the name of them? I can't remember now. Anyway, um, stomach ulcer drugs that were only to be taken under doctor's supervision. 
And then they came up with a cure for uh, stomach ulcers. And uh, they had those on this uh, going off the shelf in 90 days. It was the fastest uh, drug approval at that time. Um, and so this proving what I'm gonna tell you. But a treatment is kind of critical and is what Dr. Fauci was um, referring to as a test. And I think, or testing, I think he has the same problem I have. He doesn't know you don't know this. He doesn't know that anybody doesn't know this. But the, um, let's take hydroxychloroquine. And I'm gonna say that at different doses, you get different outcomes. And I'm just gonna make up some doses. They come in commonly in 200 milligram tablets. And I'm gonna say that if you take a 200 milligram tablet and you test it on all the coronavirus patients and give them one a day and uh, tote up all the results, you'll find that hydroxychloroquine has no impact on coronavirus at all. And I'm gonna further say for the, the uh, sake of uh, illustration, that if you give them one of those 200 milligram tablets three times a day, that you'll have 100% fatalities among the coronavirus uh, um, victims. And I'm gonna go a step further and say, instead of giving them one a day, and instead of giving them three a day, um, that we're gonna give them two a day. And we're going to find that it's 100% uh, effective at curing coronavirus, 100%. Now, how can I make up such a preposterous thing? Well, because it's true, but it's an oversimplification. In reality, you could give them 100 and not have any effect, and give them 200 and not have any effect, and give them 212 and get a 90% cure rate. It's not even linear. You reach certain thresholds of both efficacy and toxicity, where 300 really didn't kill them but 308 would. And so dose, dosage matters. And when your doctor prescribes you a drug and you're to take this many a day, that's how many you should take. And it matters. Dosage matters a lot, but it gets worse. The body metabolizes these chemicals and mostly gets rid of them. And so it might be that giving 200 milligrams would be effective, but it would be more effective to give them 50 milligrams five times a day. And what that would do would... Um, uh, maintain a more constant level of the drug in the body. When you take the first 50, it raises your level of that chemical. Your body starts to metabolize it and then it starts to come down a little bit, but then you take another one. Uh, this is the uh, antithesis of time release. Um, and so by taking it five times a day at a lower dosage, you're actually twice as effective as taking it one time a day. And then you get into the antibiotic effect where um, whether you take it with food or before meals is actually a big deal. Because if you take it with food, it might be metabolized, mostly gone by the time it's absorbed. Or if you take it on an empty stomach, uh, it basically tears up your GI tract. Now you have another problem. And so how you take it, when you take it, how much of it you take makes a difference. Oh, but it gets worse. 
I said it metabolizes, but it doesn't have to fully metabolize. It could be that this drug builds up in your system over time as you take it. And we know this is true of a number of fat soluble vitamins, but it could very well be that if you take it for five days, it will cure you of coronavirus. And if, if you take it for 10 days, uh, it'll kill you because we increase gradually our residual level of this uh, chemical to a toxic level. And so three days, you're not gonna cure the disease. 10 days, the disease is going to cure you because you're gonna be dead from the drug. And five days works out just right. It's kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. This chair is too hard. This chair is too soft. But this chair is just right. <clears throat> Why does hydroxychloroquine work at all? This is not what you're hearing on the TV. And there may be another effect. In vitro, it does seem to break down the virus. And it could do that in your body. But that's really not why I think it's saving lives in France. They are actively telling you that seniors are more prone to fatality because their immune system is not strong enough. <coughs> Simply misinformation. It is absolutely misinformation, and this goes to the key to the 2017-18 um, um, influenza where mostly young adults were killed. But it has to do with uh, the reaction of your immune system. And uh, in the case of influenza, the battle is to keep it from overreacting. It has always been so. Um, your body will cure you of this virus, I guarantee it, in every case. However, it might also kill you on the way. Because if it reacts too strongly to the invader virus, uh, the cure can kill you just as easily as the disease. And by that, I mean that at an overactive immune system produces what they're kind of euphemistically referring to as a cytokine storm. Uh, but it's an overreaction of the immune system that produces a massive amount of mucus to get rid of the invader and a massive amount of uh, T lymphocytes that kill cells. And if you can produce enough of those two things and you can get them to drain into your lungs, uh, your ability to breathe will be terminated. Your alveoli will be chock full of snot and debris cell pieces to where you cannot absorb oxygen at all and you will die without it. It wasn't really the virus that killed you. It was your own body's overactive immune response. Hydroxychloroquine is actually a drug developed in 1934. Um, even before that as quinine. Um, it comes from the flu of, a, of the bark of a South American fir tree. And, um, well, by the time the British were occupying um, India, um, there were standing orders for the British Army that everyone posted there was required by order to take a shot of quinine, quinine conic, a conic made from this bark daily. No exceptions. Officers enlisted, everybody. You had to take this quinine tonic. 
Well, if you take that um, fur mark and you boil it and you make a tonic out of it, it is unbelievably bitter. It is maybe the, one of the foulest tastes you'll ever have in your mouth. And so the British uh, um, Army uh, developed a strategy that they liked very well. They would cut it with cheap Dutch gin. And that's how the gin and tonic was born. To the point that on returning to England, uh, the British infantry and, and the officer corps certainly um, looked kind of with disdain on soldiers and sailors who had not been posted to, to India. They did not share the same camaraderie of those who had. And they continued to drink this ridiculous drink of cheap Dutch gin and tonic as kind of a thing, a nod to each other that we're in this together and these other guys, they don't have any idea. And so the gin and tonic became a very popular drink. And by the way, the tonic water you get today is sweetened, but it uh, is still got quinine in it. And it's okay to take it for malaria. Um, and uh, and I guess, by extension, it would be okay to drink a gin and tonic uh, uh, to um, improve your chances with coronavirus. But the quinine uh, attacked a um, multi-cell, a um, hundred million times bigger beastie carried by the malaria uh Anopheles mosquito uh, that was a parasite. M malaria is a um, parmesium, basically. Um, parasite uh, with a tail and much more advanced creature. But for some reason, this quinine just, these little puppies just explode. And so it's very effective against um, malaria. You know, we don't have much malaria here in Cape Dry anymore, in spite of being right on the river. Plenty of mosquitoes, but no malaria. So why do we still have hydroxychloroquine? Well, it was discovered that it has a little bit of a side effect. It would cure uh, malaria, but it may be subject uh, to other infections. And the reason was it was a mild immunosuppressant, but effective enough, but in a large enough dose, say 200 milligrams, that it could be used to treat immunological diseases caused by an overactive uh, autoimmune response. Diseases specifically, such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, where your immune system is attacking your own body. It's overactive and it's going to kill something. And so choose perfectly good cells in your body. And so suffers from lupus and a rheumatoid arthritis are not cured by this drug at all, but they uh, receive some relief from it because it suppresses uh, the immune system. And so people with overactive immune systems um, should avoid coronavirus. Um, I have uh, sort of self-diagnosed severe COPD from 50 years of uh, camel cigarettes. But I also get little psoriasis patches on my face and my arms and legs. So I probably have a little bit of a overactive immune system anyway, which kind of keeps me from getting very much, but it's overactive and coronavirus could trigger it. And I would drown in my own snot um, 
which wouldn't take much drowning because I don't have that much lung power left anyway. And so hydroxychloroquine uh, can uh, prevent cytokine storms from killing you while you're healing yourself uh, from coronavirus. And some in vitro, in glass indications are that it's kind of tough on the virus itself. And so it could be an excellent drug. Now, they're using it with erythromycin, um, brand name Zithromax, I think. Um, hydroxychloroquine, uh, brand name uh, Bayer is uh, Panquinil. And um, so they're taking it with erythromycin. Now, why would they do that? In fact, um, antibiotics would um, reduce your ability to fight off a virus slightly. Um, well, uh, because if we're going to suppress the immune system and we're a little not sure about the dosage, when you get the coronavirus, it attacks the epithelial cells in your nose and throat, and that kind of moves down into your bronchial tubes and down into your lungs. And those cells are then attacked, or they're, they're destroyed by the virus. Uh, your immune response will mop up any that have the virus, it will destroy the same cells. And so you kind of got a raw open surface there that makes you very subject to secondary bacterial infections. Uh, I advise you to get a uh, uh, new pneumonia shot, uh, a vaccine, and they have it now, and I've had one. And uh, they actually are a vaccine against five different bacteria. Uh, several of them are streptococcal type bacteria. But erythromycin is peculiarly uh, good at respiratory bacterial infections. And so since we're suppressing the immune system, uh, we don't want to suppress it so far that you fall victim to a bacterial pneumonia and you can die of that just as easily. And so they couple it with erythromycin. Of course, erythromycin kind of uh, depresses the immune system too. So these two drugs are a little bit interactive. And so back to Dr. Fauci, developing a treatment from these two drugs is not as simple as throwing them up against the wall. Now, if you got dying patients, go for it. But I hope everybody that's prescribing these things is noting the procedure they used and the outcome they got. And if we could gather enough of that, uh, we could probably develop a pretty effective, um, I feel pretty good about it, that we could develop a, an effective treatment against uh, coronavirus infections enough to uh, put a big dip in the mortality curve. Um, Dr. Fossey's position is, of course, the gold standard. You want double-blind controlled studies from here until the second coming of Christ, in which case he will decree which of the ones are actually the winner and award the um, um, Nobel Prize for medicine uh, to the winner. And I approve of all that. And it is the way to do it, except that there's a war on. And somewhere between Trump and Fauci is um, reality. Uh, but I feel very good about being able to um, reduce the mortality rate of the coronavirus to a more influenza-like level. And I think that can be done. So 
the reports you've heard on the screen about a big battle between Trump and Fauci, neither Trump nor Fauci believe any of that happened. And I don't either. Everything both of them said is absolutely true in my estimation, not just that they both believe it's true. I believe they're both absolutely correct in what they're saying. But I wanted you to understand the difference between a treatment and a drug. And it's not trivial. It's your life. They can kill you with drugs just as easily as they can cure you. And uh, certainly if you self-medicate with um, aquarium cleaner, you're not probably going to get a good outcome. <clears throat> Chloroquine sulfate and hydroxychloroquine only sound alike to uh, newscasters. And I don't know what channel the guy in Arizona was on, but I would bet he's probably an on-screen personality um, because he's certainly got the inlet for it. And there you go on uh, hydroxychloroquine and erythromycin. And the little bit I know about it, which is enough to be dangerous, um, and which appears to be about nine times more than you've been told. All right, let's talk a little bit about the dead cat bounce and the Who Fucking Cares Act. Um, this is uh, astonishing. I'm going to put up a graph of um, Dow Jones Industrial Average for this month. Uh, recall I had said that I couldn't resist, I was going to buy in a little early, but that there would be a dead cat bounce, a sucker's uh, rally um, from the stock market debacle um, driven by the coronavirus hysteria. On Monday, March 23rd, we reached kind of a low of 18,591.93 on the Dow. And we have since had a remarkable recovery to Thursday, March 26th. We're back up to 22,552, three or 4,000 points. Dropped off a little bit on Friday. Now, the nature of the dead cat bounce, as I described, was we would regain about half of our losses, um, 22,000 from 29,000. We're not there. It could go up a little bit more. Um, I'd say Monday and Tuesday of this week. And then uh, the natural mm, progression of these sorts of things is a long stair-step decline to the true bottom, which would be over several months. Time's kind of compressed right now, so I don't know. But it doesn't matter because none of this matters anymore. I don't know what's going to happen. And the reason I don't know what's going to happen is the absolute insanity of your national leaders. And I'm not really talking about Trump, but he has chimed in with it in a very um, goofy fashion. And this might be a good thing, but it most likely will generate the most unintended consequences of any legislation in the history of the Republic. And I would say 90% of them will be negative. This is a shit show Maximus. And it started with a pretty good idea. Donald Trump said he wanted to uh, suspend, to simply cancel the payroll tax for the rest of the year. And the Democrats and the media uh, just shrieked 
in derision at such an expensive and ridiculous uh, policy. I was all for it. I think it's a great idea. In fact, I would like to see it never come back. We have 100 million people each year trotting around filing an income tax return that doesn't need to be done at all. And the hidden costs to uh, all American businesses, the hidden accounting costs uh, are, I couldn't even tell you what they are. They're immense. Uh, but the cost to American taxpayers as well is immense to file this stupid tax return every year where we send money into the government and then they send it back. It's madness. It started in 1911, was supposed to be very different, but it has morphed into a monster, an inexplicable monster of idiocy. I'd rather see him just tax our electric meter or gas meter or gasoline or something where they have a better chance of getting closer to 100% compliance, much lower collection costs, and get everybody out of the business of doing these income tax returns. It's turned into such a social engineering uh, cornucopia for politicians that they just won't give it up. But I approved of Trump's proposal as being the first step into perhaps sanity. Uh, let's just don't collect Social Security and income taxes or any of that from people's paychecks until this is over. It's a great idea. It's bold. It's expensive. But it was a great idea. Well, then, how about paid leave? Can we force companies to provide paid leave? Well, I guess you could simply execute everybody that's in a company if you want to. Uh, it's not a good idea, but um, it's an idea. And then um, how about extending um, uh, unemployment benefits from three months to four months? Well, in the first place, the states pay the unemployment benefits, but if the federal government wants to step in and fund this and extend it to four months from three, well, wait a minute, the coronavirus is we're supposed to have the curve flatten and be back to work uh, in 30 days or two months. Why? What's the fourth month on the thing? Well, once it dawned on people in Congress that this was serious, this is... Uh, as the Democrats said officially, it once in a lifetime that you are presented with the possibility of a $1 trillion bill. We have to get ours. You have to get whatever you have always dreamed to get, and you got to get it in the bill. And both Democrats and Republicans did so. To the point we're, we're doing goofy things like we're going to bail out cruise lines. Well, I agree they've been affected. But we don't have any cruise lines in the United States. There's not a cruise line that operates in the United States, to my knowledge. If it is, it must be some little cruise line doing Mississippi River cruises or, you know, Snake River cruises or something like that. All of the major cruise lines fly a foreign flag. And why do they do that? To escape paying U.S. income taxes. <laughs> why should we bail them out at all? Um, what if we didn't have cruise lines? Where would old people go? I guess they just have to go into the homes. I know a lot of elderly people that for the cost of the elder care in a uh, nursing facility, uh, they can stay on a world cruise full time. It's less expensive to be on the cruise ship than it is to be in the nursing home. And so I don't have anything against cruises and cruise ships. 
I've done some cruising. I was on a cruise ship. I prefer aircraft carriers, and I kind of got done with it by the time I was 24 years old. I certainly don't want to go there as an elderly person. But I have nothing against cruise ships, but why are we bailing them out? Boeing made some bad decisions. Uh, they are struggling, and all of a sudden they're not struggling. They're guaranteed existence. They're bailed out by the U.S. government as is virtually every large corporation. And you can't fight this. This is a very popular bill. Richard Flingy is uh, thinks I'm dead wrong on this because he wants that $1,200 check. Now, he didn't need the $1,200 check, but by God, he should have it. And... Uh, Apparently, I'm going to get a $1,200 check. And what am I going to do with that? It's, uh, I shouldn't, but I don't really have any income. Um, I spend it as quick as I get it in. <laughs> and I haven't paid any income taxes in 20 years. I've been able to spend more than I've made every year. It's a talent. Me and Elon Musk have this talent. It's just like, we can spend money faster than X ones. And so, the, uh, but they're gonna send me a check for 1200 but I, it's hard to believe. So, I think this is the most idiotic bill, the CARES Act, it's advertised as being up to 2.1 trillion now, but they do acknowledge that could be $6.2 trillion. Now, how can they pass a bill for $2.1 trillion that could be $6.2 trillion? Because it's not an appropriation bill at all. It's a spending bill with no limits. However many of you qualify for $1,200, get it. And however many corporations they want to bail out, they get it. Everybody gets whatever they want. It's the biggest Santa Claus bill in history. <coughs> and the bad boy who floated the floater in his swimming pool is none other than Congressman Thomas Massey of Kentucky. And that's because his uh, senator from the same state Rand Paul was not able to be there to do that because he's home with uh, testing positive on the coronavirus. Probably has it. So the lone guy, the lone bad guy, who's now the most hated man in Washington and really in Donald Trump's shithouse is Thomas Massey of um, Kentucky. And I happen to know some about him. And I'm going to share that with you. What he did was when Nancy Pelosi called for uh, a vote by unanimous consent, which means no vote at all, just we're going to pass it if nobody objects. Thomas Massey said he objected. And since the Democrats had all gone home, they had to, enough of them come back to reach a quorum to vote on the uh, CARES Act. And then when they did, they didn't vote on it. They did not record the vote. They didn't want to. And so it was passed entirely against the Constitution of the United States. And the CARES Act is not a legal law, and if ever challenged with the Supreme Court, will be found not to be a law. And then I don't know what the hell they're gonna do. But it's entirely unconstitutional and should have never been passed. And the one guy that stood up and said this was Thomas Massey. Um, 
I like uh, Mr. Massey. I happen to know him, um, not in a biblical sense <laughs> at all, but um, he, uh, unlike most of the members of Congress, actually has a bit of an intellect, enough to get dressed and get to Washington and get home. Um, and he uh, actually attended the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he got a bachelor's degree in um, electronics engineering, a double E, which um, I kind of approve of double E's and comp sci guys. Um, and, um, and then he got a master's degree in mechanical engineering because while at MIT, he invented a little three-axis a haptic sensor feedback device. And um, that was his master's thesis was on this device. And he formed a company uh, in the year he graduated called Sensible Technologies, Inc. and immediately raised $32 million of venture capital. They had 24 patents out of the gate and 70 employees. And his first official act was to sell out and go home with his wife to their home in Lewis County, Kentucky. Uh, while he was at MIT, he uh, was a leading participant in the MIT Solar Car Club, which took second place behind a Swiss team in the Solar Electric 500 in, at the Phoenix International Raceway in 1991. So he was an EV guy long before I was. And I might say a reasonably successful one in um, getting second place in that he had a lap speed of 62 miles an hour, straightaway speeds in excess of 70 miles per hour. And this is a solar powered electric car. Um, when he returned to his home, uh, he found that he didn't really have one, but he did have a farm and he built his own house, kind of with his own hands, out of native stone. Now I'm from seven generations of home builders, builders generally, so I kind of got to admire that. But then he put solar on it. And the way I met him was uh, his batteries were going bad. And so he went to Georgia and bought a Tesla, full battery pack, brought it home and had a son, harvested all the modules out of them and wanted a controller for it. And I happened to be working on one. And so he contacted me and we sold him a controller. It was our version one controller kit and uh, he put it together successfully and he coupled it with a Raspberry Pi with display that looks remarkably like our EV TV battery display. And indeed, it um, we based it on his work. We didn't really use his code, but we used the same image and, and did a whole uh, more advanced code segment uh, to make a, a battery display. But it looks a lot like the one he's got at home. And um, I should probably send him our V2 uh, controller just to uh, close the circle there. Uh, but I sent him some words of encouragement in the, this battle over this bill and um, kind of spanked some people pretty hard on Scott Adams' um, blog, where a cartoonist holds for, forth as a medical professional um, in a very clumsy fashion. Um, a cartoonist stoned on marijuana. And um, so, um, anyway, he sent me a thank you note and said his wife sort of insisted that I hit him up for a 
donation. And uh, so I contributed $500 to his primary campaign, which apparently the Republicans are going to primary him. That's where if you don't vote with the party line, um, they try to take you out in the primary um, and get you out of Congress. So I sent him 500 bucks. I'm going to put up the, uh, uh, it's, well, it's www.thomasmassey.com, M-A-S-S-I-E. So it's not too hard to figure out. Uh, but you too could send him a little bit of encouragement. I think he courageously stood up uh, on two points. This is the stupidest freaking bill we've ever attempted. And two, if we wanted to pass it, you guys are doing it the wrong way. This isn't even constitutional. And you should be taken out back and spanked for it. And I agree with all of that. And um, so I uh, hope his solar system's going well. Um, and uh, that he does well enough in Congress to uh, get him a Tesla. Although there's something about some of these Kentucky congressmen and senators. They never seem to amass the same money that Diane Feinstein and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer do. I don't know what's the difference. Don't they all get paid the same $174,000? And he was even accused of endangering Congress by having these people fly back to Washington, D.C. to vote on this bill, which they didn't do. They did not record a vote. But they did come back and establish a quorum and... Uh, and so that was the delay Friday. And Trump was furious with him. The whole Republican Party is furious with him. Of course, the Democrats are furious with him. He is the least popular person in Washington, D.C. right now, which is pretty high um, qualification for running for president, I think. Um, I know Josh Hawley, my friend, uh, wants to uh, eventually get there, and he's young too, but he's kind of taken himself out of the race with stupid. Um, and Thomas Massey's hanging in there. And I uh, confess some admiration for the uh, Ron and Rand Pauls. Uh, I know a lot of you think they're crazy. That's what attracted me to them and started listening to what they were saying. And that's caused uh, me to stop and think about some things, which has um, always uh, uncomfortable, but kind of pleasurable at the same time. So I don't avoid those things. If someone says something that causes me to stop and think, it sort of tickles my sense of whimsy, despite the pain. And, um, so that's uh, what's going on there with the bill. It's an open-ended two to six trillion dollar <coughs> bill voted on primarily by people and reported on by people who can't multiply six times nine and get the right answer before the third try. But they know all about 2.1 trillion and 6.2 trillion. We have a budget of 1.4 trillion. We're, we're spending money we don't have on a problem we don't understand in massive quantities and making up for all the lack of information with good intentions and big numbers. And I'm going to predict right now that this will allow us to harvest unintended consequences for a generation. Astonishing unintended consequences where we're going to say over and over, boy, I wish we had that one back. Um, Ill-considered 
ill-conceived and a Santa Claus cornucopia of plenty for every politician in Washington, D.C. And every American. Richard will be very happy to get his check for 1200 bucks. I wonder how long the taste will last in his mouth until it dawns on him he's been ahead. The next step is if we can vote all of ourselves 1,200 heirs, why don't we um, vote all of us millionaires? <coughs> the good news is you get $1,200. The bad news is a roll of toilet paper, well, not really a roll, a six-roll pack is going to go for 180 bucks, and a quart of orange juice will be uh, 225 This is going to overstimulate the economy to a level that we don't have any data on. But we could have a 60,000 Dow by December. It's the great American cash giveaway. And we have nothing to compare it to. Our last bailout was to banks. It was a loan and we made money on it and it was to prevent the fall of the banking system. Um, and however much you want to socially characterize that, it's pretty much to every man benefit, and particularly the working poor, to be able to go to the bank and cash your check. And if the banks had folded, you, you would know what economic issues for the poor really were. Um, and so, uh, but this one, we're just going to bail out everybody. Um, in fact, just shower them with cash to stimulate an economy that was already a little twitchy at the top when the coronavirus came in. And all this to prevent people from suffering when it wasn't their fault. Well, Pogo said we've met the enemy and he is us. And that's your money that's being spent on you after they take out a percentage for them. It, it, it's just crazy. This is insane. It's not insane in any particular terms. It's just generally freaking insane. And uh, so how does this affect the dead cap bounce? We've just taken the history of the stock market off the table. I have no idea what's going to happen. It's, uh, it's not going to be uh, what should happen or what I would have expected to happen. What's going to happen with the virus? Well, I got some further bad news. I said I didn't believe in the hysteria around the virus. I didn't say I didn't believe in the virus. And it's not going away that easy. Um, what should they have done? Well, number one, they should have shut down domestic travel entirely. Like nobody is allowed on the interstate unless they happen to have 18,000 pounds of food or toilet paper in the truck behind them. And no domestic air travel at all. And... Um, I think that would have been, for the U.S., almost more effective than uh, uh, self-distancing. We didn't have any uh, coronavirus in Cape Girardeau until this week. Now we have three confirmed cases. And uh, uh, let's talk about hospitals. Hospitals work on an economic um, model that they stole from hotels. And that is that they need to operate day to day and week to week at a maximum capacity. They want to have just a few beds left all the time. And so um, 
they were never going to have enough uh, medical facilities for um, the coronavirus or anything beyond a, uh, a mass shooting in Las Vegas or something. Uh, that's as, as much over capacity as they maintain. And as I recall, that Las Vegas required three hospitals to handle anyway. So it, it's not there. They don't have the capacity. Uh, we're not going to flatten the curve uh, to where the uh, medical um, service can handle it because they didn't maintain any level of overcapacity at all for profit, uh, for profit motives. They, uh, Kate Gerardo uniquely uh, doesn't care about that. We have two hospitals here. They each have two boards and they are muliously and blindly competitive. Now that doesn't mean they compete on price. They compete on who is the biggest, fanciest hospital. And so one of them will have a two year program of expansion um, to make bigger and better, a whole new buildings added on, and, um, beds and uh, facilities, and labs and so forth. And the other one will respond with a three-year program. This has been going on since uh, I came back here in 2020. So we have enough hospital here uh, for the entire state of Missouri. Um, and they still build. And it's not to ever uh, cover any business they get. It's to be bigger and newer than the other hospital. And, and they've kind of gone insane with that. To our benefit, we have plenty of hospital. Um, although I'm told by nurses that they're completely not ready with personal protective equipment and so forth for the coronavirus. But so far, we've got three uh, people. And they have the city on lockdown. We have no restaurants. Or, you can go to the pharmacy. You can go to the grocery store. Um, but that's about it. I'm, uh, I've learned to order groceries from Schnucks delivered and they just leave it on my porch and I may never go back in the store. So for stock recommendations, I'm looking for companies that will receive a step change in business that will not evaporate with the coronavirus. And the two I have um, selected with the most enthusiasm are uh, Amazon.com and Zoom. Zoom is a small company, but with an excellent uh, management of a guy who did online video services so well, he sold his company once to Cisco Systems as Web Video or WebX, Web something or other. Uh, years ago, and it kind of got lost in the Cisco machine. They never did much with it, but they paid him a lot of money for it. And he's kind of bounced around since then, long since uh, expired non-compete. And he started a company called Zoom that uses Amazon Oz and makes a video conferencing easy. Now, Apple really dropped the ball on this. Uh, because they don't have Steve Jobs. Um, and they really dropped the ball. They had FaceTime and they never really, Tim Cook has never understood why they have FaceTime or what anybody would do with it. And so setting up a video conference on FaceTime is error prone, hard to do, and it doesn't work most of the time. Mono a mono, okay, but three or four different locations, it's impossible. Zoom has got it down to where anybody can do it. You can't hardly screw it up and it works superbly. Better video, less drop frames, uh, everything is on the Amazon's Oz base. And they were already doing great as a company. So the other day they're trading at 123. I bought some call contracts for August 21st, I think, at 165. Well out of the money, so I got them pretty right. Um, 
The next day they went to $164. Um, and I was already in the money in one day. Um, and now they dropped back down around 144. What do I mean by a step change? They're going to introduce people to this. They mostly sell it to uh, businesses as a software with service. You pay a monthly subscription for the full package and, um, and you get the apps and you get the service and, um, and they sell that to Fortune 500 companies primarily. Of course, with the work from home thing, this has gotten to be a big deal because companies found that it wasn't that hard to set up a video meeting. And so it has overnight introduced Zoom to a lot of people that wouldn't have discovered it for two or three more years. And they're using Zoom for all this work at home thing but I'm going to predict that when the virus is long gone and you don't need to work from home, and nobody's going back. Um, oh, you'll go back to work at the office, but the companies that have Zoom are gonna keep using it. Um, they're gonna step up, so they're gonna get a big step in new blood, new meat, that comes in and starts with Zoom, and they're not gonna wanna give it up once they've experienced it. Amazon.com, my God, this company has won so long and so many times, it does not sound like prophecy. But they didn't go down that much. They got down to 17 something, maybe high 16s at the low, but they're back at 19 and change, 1900 and change. Um, they have not really suffered through this uh, downturn. And there's a reason. They're selling more stuff and delivering more stuff than they ever did at Christmas any year ever. They're adding 100,000 employees. There's a lot of stuff you can't get through them now because they just are overburdened. And uh, they'll work their way out of that. However, uh, interesting thing on the way to the forum, I would guess they've added 10 or 20 million new accounts of people that are using Amazon for the first time. And the trick is, is once you've got your credit card number in there, your shipping address, and you've used it a few times, you just point at stuff and click and it shows up on your porch. And so, if they add 20 million new users, they're gonna keep 18 million of them after this is over. It's not gonna fall back down. Once you experience Amazon, you use Amazon at some level. And so I think they're gonna do great. Um, we'll see. But, um, even Jim Cramer is saying this could be a $3,000 company by the end of the year. And I have some $2,500 and $3,000 call options. And I mean hundreds of them. Hundreds of them uh, for September. And I've got quite a few for June at the $3,000 level. And I don't need Amazon to get to $3,000 or $2,500 to make a shit pot on these leveraged way out of the money call options. And so I would normally right now uh, get out again at what I think is the peak of the dead cat bounce. This CARES Act has thrown economics worldwide up into the air. You can't predict uh, if it's ever going to rain again uh, at this point. Um, it's, uh, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Thomas Massey is a hero for even trying to uh, uh, resist it. And I tell you what, guys. 
Um, every uh, picture tells a story and every group needs a leader. But uh, what I like to see is when Donald Trump went down that tunnel to the debate after the, uh, what was it, the, the video of him on a bus talking about pussy or something. He had no team. Nobody was with him. He was all alone. His wife wasn't there. Kellyanne Conway didn't show. And he marched down that tunnel with some Secret Service guys. No family, no aides, nobody. And he walked into a room to a uh, um, debate that even the moderator was certain would never happen. And his two sons were sitting there, studiously looking at the floor in shame and despair. And he looked at them and he never moved his lips, but I could hear his words. Hold my beer, I'm only gonna show you this once. <clears throat> that was the day I fell in love with Donald Trump. It's not such a big deal to lead the failing party to be at the head of the army that loses. What's a big deal is when you're all by yourself and you're the only savage on the buffalo hunt willing to stand up by yourself against 10,000 charging Japanese or Chinese or ISIS. You're the only guy with a gun and you ain't going down. That's how to get to me. And Thomas Massey was the only savage on the buffalo hunt, right, wrong, or indifferent. And history will show whether this bill was a good idea or a bad idea. But even on the technicalities, he was correct. You don't throw out the Constitution of the United States because it's convenient. We have it for a reason. We have it to give us guidelines for when we're in trouble, not just when it's everything is going great. And he's entirely alone, abandoned by all. And as I told him, Thomas, you need to worry about your wife loves you, and you need to worry about your dog loves you, but you don't really have anybody else that you really need. Uh, to have uh, love you. Um, you just stand there and do the right thing and let them all twirl on a stick and you'll be just fine. Stay with us. There'll be more EVTV.